So uh, this is a joint work with Lior Kirsch, who's sitting in the audience, wave up there if you want to speak with him later. Um, so our lab works on uh, trying to characterize and model patterns of gene expression in the brain. We heard a few talks about this topic, and we're going to hear more tomorrow. Um, since this is a broad audience, let me, let me stress that the, the transcriptome, the set of genes and, uh, that are expressed, and the, their level of expression changes from one cell type to the other, from one tissue to the other, from one brain region, and also as we showed uh, this morning, um, from one age to another. But the problem is that we really don't understand the principles governing these changes. We don't know what determines if a gene is gonna be expressed and when and where and how. Um, so we were thinking that development of the brain should play an important role uh, governing these principles. So the specific question that we, we asked here was uh, what patterns of gene expression in the adult human brain actually uh, depend on the development process. So let me put, uh, when I say development, let me put that in the context of what we're interested in here. Uh, the neural tissue starts from what's known as the neural plate, then it folds to the neural tube and um, uh, here color-coded you see several segments uh, that later turn into brain structure, the forebrain, the midbrain, uh, hindbrain, and later on the, the forebrain, which turns into the cortex, uh, expands a lot. It covers the midbrain, uh, creating two hemispheres, and then it expands even more, creating this wiggled, wrinkled uh, structure that you, you all know as the adult brain. So what we wanted to uh, look at is uh, these expression patterns in the adult brain, and we used a data set provided by the Allen Institute. This is a data set of post-mortem human brains from six donors uh, with hundreds of tissues sampled from each brain, and for each uh, tissue they had the microarray, so they have the full expression profile for all genes. So imagine you have uh, many, many points here with a high resolution. Uh, so to, to handle all these uh, locations, we treated all these brain regions through this uh, ontology that the Allen uh, Institute provided. Um, so this ontology has hundreds of regions, and the important thing is that it roughly corresponds, or it, is, it agrees with the development process. For instance, on the left here you see uh, frontal regions, mid regions, and hindbrain regions. Uh, for, to illustrate, I'm coloring here the regions with the same color, so you see the frontal areas here. So, when we come to analyze this data, the first thing you could do is to look at what regions have similar expression profile. And one way to do that is just to take all regions and cluster them based on their expression similarity. And when you do that, you get that this hierarchical structure from the clustering actually corresponds and is closely related to the ontology structure. For instance, you have front areas here, uh, hind areas here. But, but of course, this is clustering that is based on the full genome, and it is possible that just a small number of genes drive this similarity between regions. So what we actually wanted to, do, to know is what regions, uh, what, sorry, what genes drive this similarity between brain regions. So to do that, we went and defined an index that was per single gene, and here's, here's what we basically did. This is uh, an example for one gene, neuro D1. So basically you take a pair of tissues and you measure two types of distances. One is just how similar their expression is, uh, kind of expression distance, and the other is the distance between these tissues on the ontology tree. And you repeat that for all pairs of tissues and you get a joint distribution of the expression distance and the ontology distance. And for this gene you see a strong correspondence, which basically means that if you take two areas that are close in the ontology, they, they have similar expression for this specific gene. And you can quantify that uh, using some spermin correlation. So this is a measure for an individual gene. Now we repeated that over many, many genes, over all genes, and what I'm showing you here is this distribution of this score, which we call the brain region ontology agreement score. And so each curve here corresponds to another uh, donor, and it is compared with the shuffle data. So what we find here is that in practice, almost all genes, like 92% of the genes, have a significant agreement with the brain ontology. 
So uh, this is interesting because it means that when you look at the expression level of a gene, it actually reflects the embryonic origin of the region where you measure the gene, not only the function of the gene. So you should take that into account. Now, uh, we, we then repeated that uh, in another data set uh, that was discussed this morning, data set provided by the Sestan group, the BrainSpan date, uh, uh, using adult brains only. Uh, so here I'm showing here, again, the distribution of this broad agreement score for the two data sets. Uh, each point here is a gene, and you see there is actually a strong agreement between the two data sets, even though these are different regions and different uh, donors, etc. So what can you, when you tell uh, about these genes? Uh, I'll just do that very shortly. Uh, we can look at uh, genes that are s uh, expressed specifically in some cell types. Uh, so you see here that neuron genes expressed in neurons have much higher brain uh, agreement with the ontology, while astrocytes have less. If you only focus on cortical neurons, this is actually reversed, so this is interesting. Um, two more interesting stories is if you look at uh, developmental genes like axon guidance, they also, and this is again in the adult brain, they still retain uh, differential expression across regions, even though their main function is, is during development. So it's possible to have other um, functions that, that we need to study. Uh, finally, uh, housekeeping genes are genes that are involved in fundamental functions, uh, like basic metabolism. And uh, again, it's interesting that the, actually the brain uses different genes in different areas. So uh, just a quick uh, conclusion, uh, what we find here is that the aerial expression patterns actually are in, in agreement, in close agreement with the ontology that agrees with the development. And also it's interesting that many of these the develop, families of development genes may have some other functions in the adult brain that we should look at. So, so far I told you about um, spatial patterns of expression. I want to spend two minutes on temporal patterns of expression. Um, I, uh, we, we focused on uh, the period of adolescence. I have two teenager kids at home, so you can, uh, some of you can sympathize why this was personally interesting. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, in general, adolescence is a, is a period that has, uh, good. Uh, teenagers go under uh, massive uh, you know, behavioral cognitive changes. And also, there's a much higher prevalence of psychopathologies. Uh, including mood disorders, depression, and aggressive impulsive behavior. And it's, of course, very interesting, and we actually don't know that, what could be the molecular mechanisms underlying these, these uh, strong changes. So we focused on two specific systems, the serotonin system and the dopamine system, since these are known to be tightly related to uh, disorders like depression, uh, drug targets, etc., SSRI. Uh, and what we did was basically to look at all genes in these two systems, including presynaptic, postsynaptic, all these genes, uh, signal transduction. And basically what we did, I'm skipping the details, is to measure for each gene how strongly their expression changes from childhood to adolescence. So what I'm showing you here is a heat map where each row is, corresponds to a different gene and column to a different brain area. Uh, this is the brain span data again. Um, and uh, the, the color here corresponds to the magnitude of the change between a childhood and adolescence. So what do we find? Uh, first, in, we, we hardly see anything in the dopamine system, but we do find two genes that have strong transition between childhood and adolescence in the, in the serotonin system. Uh, here's uh, how the, the measurements actually look, and I, I, don't, I don't think you could see, but there's a, there's a period here that we consider as adolescence. So you see this marked change. Now, these genes are actually very interesting. They're not just any genes. These are autoreceptors. So, uh, sorry, these genes code for autoreceptors. These are uh, receptors that are located on the presynaptic side and allow the presynaptic cell to monitor how much serotonin is secreted into the cleft. So this is kind of a feedback uh, control loop. And it's, and it's pretty interesting that th this control mechanism is one that changes abruptly in, uh, in adolescence. Uh, so let me conclude. Uh, we found that uh, spatial expression patterns uh, in the adult human brain uh, are actually tightly re related to, uh, to the, the brain region ontology uh, corresponding to development. And this happens for the vast majority of genes, more than 90% of the genes. Uh, and I think this is important because it means that when you try to interpret a gene expression pattern in an adult brain, you just have to take into account this baseline that is not just uniform across uh, regions. 
Second, uh, we found these two specific serotonin autoreceptors uh, that exhibit this uh, huge uh, expression transition during, from childhood to adolescence. And this is important because it puts a focus on, on a possible mechanism involved in these changes. Of course, uh, we don't know if this is involved in depression and we're doing some uh, follow-up work. Uh, so, thank you very much. Back into to actually uh, you know, sort of confirm your result at the level of the, uh, the development. Uh. So uh, there are a lot of microarrays taken in, uh, let's say, like depressed people and control groups. Uh, there are no time forces, uh, and also the the ages at which you get these these brains is uh, very limited. So um, so we are planning to do experiment in mice. Uh, one thing I didn't say is that this transition, when, once we found these, uh, these results, we went and looked at other species. It actually happens in monkeys, but we don't see, for these specific genes in mice, we don't see that. So this could be a primate uh, result. For a human development, one is Lipska and Weinberger. And the other one is ours, the GEO data sets for okay. all development for and frontal cortex. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, I, so, so for depressed? Or, I, no. I, I, I think the question was for uh, depressed. For development. <laughs> right. And yes, there is, there is also one for depression. I can, I can tell 